All right, we got some people loading in. Thanks for joining us today. Sweden, all right. Denver, I'm going to be making it out there, I think, in the next two months. First trip of 2021. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to launch a poll just to kind of gauge um, everybody's position so we can uh, make sure to tailor this, this talk today to be as, as relevant to everybody as possible. Looks like uh, most of you are on the the uh, production side of brewing, which is awesome. Um, you got a couple hobbyists and then maybe more of the, the admin side as well. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, microbial stability to packaging op options and look at uh, beer packaging. So, you know, joined by uh, my good friend Simon of Cask Global Canning Solutions. Uh, you know, we're really going to be looking at uh, canning options and maybe how um, shelf life and some of the microorganisms that you're working with or uh, maybe unintentional might affect that shelf life and some considerations um, therefore. So as I mentioned, uh, my name is Eric. I'm the education manager. Simon, did you want to introduce yourself, uh, who CASC is and um, a little bit about your background and maybe how we met? Uh, coincidentally, yeah. two or three years ago at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. Uh, yeah, so some, my name is Simon Glazier. So I'm the market account manager for the sort of southwest of the United States. Um, so yeah, so my, you know, so a little high level look at CASC here. So uh, CASC, about 20, 21 years ago, we sort of uh, were the, you know, invented micro canning in a sense. Uh, our founder, Pete Love, uh, found a niche and saw, saw the demand for cans in the craft industry. And uh, partnered with you know, uh, Dale uh, at Oscar Blues for their original launch into Kansas as well. And uh, we just sort of grown over the last 21 years uh, to you know, really help the, the craft market um, in the brewing side and then beyond into basically every, every beverage market that it entails. Um, and then you know, a little bit about myself. I, you know, I'm the market account manager here, but prior to CASC, uh, I went to you know, Dalhousie University on the east coast of Canada here for biology. Uh, and then took that into the brewing industry where I, you know, helped start a couple of breweries, you know, worked on the production side, you know, did some packaging uh, back in the day. And then just previous to Cask, I was the quality assurance manager at Cowbell Brewing in the small town of Blythe, Ontario, which uh, is where, you know, I, I met Eric as a, you know, proud alumni, Yeast Essentials <laughs> 2.0 course of 2018. Uh, so I spent the, the three days down in San Diego. I think it was the February um, cohort there. So that's where we met and uh, you know, super excited to be on here and you know, help and you know, educate and you know, just toss some light on the, on the packaging industry, um, which is you know, growing exponentially right now. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, been a crazy year, I'm sure, for, for everybody, but for, for you and Cask in particular. Uh, you know, when we started talking and kind of just reconnected, you know, we, our, our brewing companies started um, doing small runs of canning as well. And there's been a lot of uh, challenges and considerations that you know we never really looked at before. So I think the the conversation is is super relevant because it seems like a small decision to just change the format of your packaging, but in in our experience and in reality, it's been a huge experience. A huge experience, um, and there's a lot of considerations that uh, you know. I probably could have jumped on a call with you before and spoken about as opposed to learning uh, maybe the hard way a little bit. <laughs> uh, when when you came down to San Diego, was that when we went to Alesmith? Is that where we went for like one of the yeah. happy hours? Cool. Yeah, Alesmith and uh, Ballast Point, I believe, were the two. Yeah, right on. Uh, so yeah, today, you know, we'll talk about defining packaging quality. I think that's something that, you know, that the industry... Um, puts the, the cart before the horse often and, and doesn't look at what are goals or what are the definitions of quality? What are, what's a broad range of our specs that we're looking for before doing something? We often just jump right into it and say, let's go ahead and do this and then retroactively look at how it went. Uh, and so we can talk about that a little bit and some of the ranges and some of the concepts that, you know, um, brewers looking to switch to uh, that packaging format should be looking at in, in the sense of looking at uh, DO versus TPO can maybe break that down a little bit because I think that's often misunderstood um, product loss, you know, and looking at the 
financials of that shelf life, which is uh, what I've had a, a big hand in um, with a lot of our product, uh, seam quality, and then, um, you know, impactless packaging for optimal quality, right? So the your beer can really only get get worse uh, once it comes out of the, the conditioning tank and the bright tank. Uh, you know, and, and everything that you're doing is to impact that beer as minimal as possible. So we can get into some of the details of what that actually means. So uh, what does quality mean when packaging? So, you know, when, when you're looking at uh, taking a really high quality beer, you're pulling a, a sample from the pigtail and you're like, man, this beer is awesome. Like it's, it's perfect. And do you often see that beer change at any point from that experience? Is the customer getting the same experience that you're getting pulling a, a sample right off the tank? And what does cask do or what does uh, canning do to ensure that that experience is uh, cohesive through the different um, transfers and transportation and storage and all that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I totally agree, you know, uh, as brewers, you know, you spend, you know, weeks on end, even months sometimes, you know, uh, fine tuning a beer and, you know, putting your blood, sweat and tears into a product. Uh, and then, you know, the, the final step and the final sort of point where, you know, it leaves your facility right before that is the packaging. And, you know, you put all the, all this time and effort into, you know, make sure that that beer in that tank is as high as quality as possible. But we want to continue that quality into packaging. Um, so that it really comes down to what we'll talk about here, you know, is that, you know, low waste, you know, keeping that dissolved oxygen low, which will then, you know, allow you to have that same experience over time. Uh, Cause we know, you know, factors like oxygen are going to deteriorate the flavor over time um, with that shelf life, but we want to make sure that, you know, that experience is the same for as long as possible, you know, as many months as possible before, you know, it gets into the, the store shelves and then into your customer's hands and they consume it. And we want to make sure that, you know, their experience, say, sitting on the beach in San Diego, having that pint uh, out of a can is the very same uh, or even as close to, as possible to, you know, when they're walking over to the brewery, uh, you know, just off the beach there and having that right off the tap. So that's the main goal here is to keep that as you know, consistent uh, as possible. And do you think packaging has one of the largest impacts um, to beer quality, um, you know, once it comes to like post conditioning and um, is that a big differentiator between really high quality breweries and not right because like you know Sierra Nevada is always going to taste good and Sierra Nevada pale ale like that the way that recipe is designed lends itself to um, a, a little bit wider uh, range of variables when it comes to storage and still maintaining quality and freshness but do you see that as a pretty big differentiator? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, you can put basically similar, similar to, you know, uh, on the brewing side, the, you know, the conditioning side where, you know, you're monitoring that and there's so many small variables that can happen, you know, on any given day that can, you know, deteriorate or affect your products. And, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, during the packaging process that, you know, you're controlling all those variables and, you know, you're seeing it happen in, in real time and know when say, you know, say something does go wrong, you know how to fix that right away. And we'll make sure that downtime as minimal as possible. So that throughout that packaging run, you know, you're getting that best quality. Uh, and like you said, you know, the, the, there's a lot of technology out there and there's a lot of systems out there, um, but there's a lot of considerations needed to take into place because, um, you know, anyone can package beer just like anyone can, can brew beer, but it's just a matter of, you know, having that, the packaging equipment on hand that gives you the peace of mind that's going to be consistent and what you expect, um, you know, every, every single day when you're back. Awesome. Um, yeah, maybe we can just briefly talk on just general packaging types, right? Um, kegs are, you know, the most obvious and it's a, a format that every brewery pretty much, um, you know, has the majority of of their, their volume going into, uh, maybe not the last year, but generally, um, how do these three different uh, types of formats, like what are the considerations when looking at them uh, from a quality standpoint or a process standpoint? Yeah, I mean, with kegs, I think the first thing, I think with all, all these products or all these, you know, options here is, you know, the, the cleanliness, you know, and the making sure that you're going into a clean keg, you know, you don't want to, 
know, make sure you don't want to put your nice, beautiful beer into a dirty, you know, contaminated keg. So then when it gets to your customer or that, you know, that, um, you know, that contract or that restaurant where that's going to skew the result there. Um, and like you said, you have you know, larger volumes there. So it's more efficient that way for sure. Um, I think having the cleanliness and, you know, the, those proper parameters as in, you know, maintaining and testing the, the CO2 and the oxygen in that can, or sorry, in the keg, uh, basically doing the, this very similar, you know, quality checks as you would on cans and bottles, but also doing that on kegs. So you have sort of a, you know, a starting point. So, you know, when it left the brewery or you know, when it entered the keg, uh, it was at this parameter. And then, you know, if you have any issues down the roads, say, uh, you know, a restaurant complains that you know, they're having some off flavors or some weird effects that you know that you've done everything in your control in-house to know that it wasn't, uh, wasn't you know, within your wheelhouse, but it was something, you know, between your, uh, the brewery and the, the restaurant that something went wrong. Um, and then, you know, with, with cans, you know, these are great points, you know, for, for shipping and now that distribution is growing, um, it'd be a great avenue for breweries to get that product out the door. Uh, you know, having that, that lightweight, you know, packaging op opportunity, you know, low cost as well, uh, you know, prevents skunking, you know, having, you know, there's no, no, no UV light coming into those cans, you know, they're hermetically sealed. Uh, and the big other thing is, you know, the sustainability side of it. So, you know, cans versus bottles where, you know, cans, I think it's the stat is 75% of all aluminum in the world is recycled. Um, it's one of the most, you know, sustainable, you know, products out there as, as an aluminum. So having those cans out there, uh, it's just good for, good for the earth. And I think tomorrow is Earth Day. So it could be a great uh, little segue there for, for Earth Day. Um, but then bottles, you know, it's uh, tried, true, and tested over the years. Um, you know, there will be some different factors coming to play there with the seal um, on the crown and, you know, with the, the UV light. Um, but like you said here, some of those higher quality beers, you know, some of the sours, you know, bottle fermentation. Um, there is that definitely that niche out there in the industry that, you know, that definitely constitutes more towards, uh, you know, bottles. Yeah, you know, one, one thing that I've seen, there's been a, a huge um, shift in consumer preference and it's taking taken a long time. And you mentioning, you know, Dale's Pale Ale, like that beer, I could only imagine when they first started selling that in cans, like what accounts and how they reacted to it. Because I think they're fortunate being in Colorado that they're probably a little more receptive to it, being uh, more lifestyle driven. Right. I'm saying this is something you can throw in your backpack and take with you hiking. But you know, it took, it took a long time and it's been fairly recent. Like it's been the last 10 years that all of a sudden everybody wants something in cans. And I think there's a lot of economic, uh, you know, perspective that, that lends itself to that. And what I've seen, you know, in the last year in the States, there's been a lot of relaxed laws on shipping direct to the consumer, uh, which hasn't really been allowed before, or if it is, there's a lot of, um, stipulations for it and a lot of costs that you have to, to pass on. And, and instead, at least in California, um, they've allowed it, they've made it a lot easier to ship to the direct consumer. And, and it's something that's been very common in other industries, but not super common in beer. And a big reason for that has to do with price point, you know, per ounce, per bottle, per weight, and so on and so forth. And, you know, when you're spending $20 on a bottle of wine and you have a case of it, it's okay to, to justify 50 bucks to ship it. But when you have a couple six packs that you'll drink at a night with friends, I, I'm not going to spend $50 on that. So what cans where it kind of helps a little bit, but I think it's still an issue of a price, you know, a, a price per unit um, and people's like mental, like the, the way that they look at that and process that is that cans have been a lot uh, cheaper just due to the lighter, lighter weight. And then they also take up uh, less space. So your packaging, the box you're actually shipping in can be less. Uh, on the retail distribution side as well, uh, specifically talking about 12 ounce cans, like they take up less shelf space. So I've seen uh, a benefit of that in a lot of retailers preferring that format just because they can stack too high yeah. as opposed to a six pack of, of bottles that takes up probably 150% of the same footprint. Yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's all considerations. And I think um, from a craft brewer perspective, um, always looking at quality first is most important. And is any of these changes in packaging for 
format or any of these processes to, to utilize these different package types uh, going to affect my quality? And if so, how? Um, because it should always be looking to improve quality or at least retain the quality um, that you currently have. And I think that's, um, you know, a big hurdle for a lot of people purchasing patch packaging equipment. And you can obviously speak to this a lot more than I can, but it's, it's a huge investment and to not feel confident or familiar with it. Like when you invest in something of that, you know, six figures, like you have to be damn sure that that's the piece of equipment you want and that it works for you and fits your needs. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, great sort of segue into, you know, the, one of the biggest factors when it comes to quality, you know, is oxygen, uh, dissolved oxygen, and then, you know, total package oxygen, where, you know, there, there's, they like said, there's so many different packaging lines out there, but, um, you know, there, there's so many things that, you know, from a high level, every canning system sort of can look the same, but when you really break down each system, you know, you can really see which ones uh, will give you that better and that lower, you know, consistent dissolved oxygen, because the, the last thing I want uh, for your, for any customer is, you know, to have spend all that time, like I said, you know, getting that beer at the door and then, you know, your customer is, you know, cracking that nice, you know, juicy IPA and it just comes out, you know, super, you know, very you know, oxidized and you get that sort of cardboard flavor and just that diminished hot profile. Um, and, you know, I always went by sort of the, so sort of the mindset that, you know, uh, you know, a customer will buy a beer once, but are they going to buy that beer the second time if that experience wasn't, you know, uh, you know, what they were expecting are optimal and that's sort of you know, there's so many different beers out there now there's, the market's so saturated that to be competitive uh, i think it all comes down to quality in the sense that you know you want to make sure you spend it, it is an investment it is can be costly but you know you put that money in now um and and do it sort of in, in that smart controlled way and then it's going to pay off in dividends down the road where you know you're going to be making money uh you're not going to be dumping beer down the drain and that's the, that's really the last thing we want is to be you know wasting beer uh, going down the drain. Totally. Yeah. I think the key there is preserving quality, right? We, we have such a good handle on creating a quality product again, up until the beer leaves our door and that controls often lost. And it depends on your relationships with your distributors and who you are, but for, for most breweries or anybody canning uh, different beverages, it's, it's really out of your control at that point. And I, I would argue that, you know, most beer out there is probably pretty good at some point and due to poor packaging and, and poor storage, it just de degrades so quickly. And it's not really the consumer's fault. I think it has something to do with the infrastructure on, um, you know, the, the monopoly that a lot of larger breweries have on shelf space, on cooler space, and a lot of retailers just being conditioned to think it's okay to to leave things warm and um, expedite that that oxidation that's going to happen so you know it's up to the brewery to minimize that oxidation knowing that it's it's going to happen over time um you know you mentioned um dissolved oxygen and, and um total packaged oxygen like do and tpo what what's the difference there right and um how should a a brewery be looking at that and what are some considerations or levels coming from the yeast side you know we talk about dissolved oxygen all the time yeast loves oxygen we're we're intentionally the only time in your brewing process that you should be adding oxygen has to do with yeast metabolism and growth right yeah. but every other point it's you know trying to minimize that and the levels of oxygen that we're talking about from the yeast perspective are in the parts per million right we're talking eight to 12 plus parts per million. That's a, a lot of oxygen. Yeah. Everywhere else you're, you're talking about parts per billion. So it's, it's very minimal. Um, it often requires uh, special pieces of equipment too, right? To, to manage that in a very short time frame to be looking at that. Could you touch on uh, the differences a little bit? Um, how people should be taking headspace into account when they should be looking at it and how it might impact their product? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think the, the first place to look, you know, is uh, you need that sort of, you know, that control point of what is your sort of uh, benchmark uh, dissolved oxygen level in the tank, because that's going to be what you're going to be basing the rest of your sort of packaging analysis off of. Uh, so say there's, you know, uh, oxygen, you know, measuring devices, you know, hook that up to your tank, get that reading, uh, you know, hopefully it's as low as possible uh, throughout that process. Uh, and then from there, you're going to take that result 
and then you know then go into the, the say the first couple of cans coming off that line doing say a shaken dissolved oxygen test uh and that's just going to be giving you basically a ballpark of if that dissolved oxygen level has skyrocketed it's like okay something's happened you know in the the lines or you know the motion of that liquid going from the tank to the system there is something wrong there you know whether it's say a leaky you know gasket um you know or say you know just something uh, a little fine tune that needs to happen a quick fix and then so you you go from there make that adjustment and then complete the the packaging run once you know it's at that good great range uh, of what you're sort of uh, looking for and then you know getting the total package auction that's sort of the the whole ball um that that whole product where it takes into headspace you know it takes into consideration the temperature of that product uh, there's more variables there. So when, when, if you're looking at a can from a high level, you know, you're going to have your liquid, your beer liquid in the can and then the headspace and all that auction um, will likely be, if it's in, there'll be some in that liquid, there'll be some obviously more in that headspace and what that shaking will do, will bring all that into equilibrium and then doing that total packaged um, or the TPO, you know, reading there will give you that whole sort of, um, you know, the mass look at that product being like, okay, so this is my benchmark here. Uh, and you know, that's where it's sort of the dissolved oxygen. So DO and TPO can sort of be confused where the, the big sort of number when it comes to packaging is that total packaged oxygen because that brings all variables into play where that DO and that shaken DO basically give you the critical control points to look at your product and see you know, where do we need to make adjustments in real time here to ensure that you know, those levels are as low as possible throughout the whole run uh, and every single, every single run for that matter. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, how quickly does that reaction happen, right? Because we have a um, TTB certified analytical lab here where we offer a, a lot of different, different types of testing. And that question often gets asked, can we send our, our sample in um, to test DO or TPO? And it, it's not really something we can test for due to the logistics of shipping. How quickly does that reaction happen and when should they be um, taking that sample? Yeah, it's almost immediate. Uh, I mean, the, that, that chemical reaction of oxidation will happen, you know, at, to some extent right away. And that's where, you know, it's super important to make that reading and do that analysis. Say right when that can comes off the line, you're picking that off right away, throwing that into your measurement device uh, and see when that reading is. Because say, if, like you said, if you leave that even an hour or two, uh, you know, you might be seeing some nice juicy, you know, low numbers and you're like, oh, great, this is perfect. You know, our system was doing great when in fact, you know, that reactions happened to some extent and your results were actually, you know, a lot higher. Um, so to your point, you know, it's sort of a, it would be great, you know, if we can control that, ship it down to, um, you know, a testing facility such as White Labs, just due to the high cost of those measuring instruments. But it's just one of those, it's just the reality of, you know, the chemical reaction um, and then on the, on the product side, you know, that reaction is happening immediately, but you know, the effects say that the flavor effects and, you know, optically what you might be seeing there might take a couple weeks, uh, before you see those results. Um, but at that point, you know, you're, you're sort you're well beyond, you know, making that, making that tweak. So the best portion or the best time would be to do it immediately. So if you see a high number, then you can make the modification on your canning line to then, you know, ensure that the rest of your packaging run is within spec. Uh, for your quality standards. Yeah, that totally makes sense. What, I mean, what kind of levels would you consider, you know, that you would maybe need to, to make some adjustments or are great? I mean, are you talking 80 PPB? Are you talking 200 PPB? Or is like 30 PPB the standard you should be looking for? Yeah, I think that's all sort of dependent on, on the facility, but I would, you know, look for, you know, 15, 30, you know, PPB. Um, you can go, say, go as high as, say, 40 PPB. Uh, but then when it's, you know, when it's shooting over say a hundred uh, and well beyond that, that's when you know that something for sure is wrong. And I think that also comes back to, you know, you use that benchmark for that tank dissolved auction reading, that's your benchmark. And if you know, if it's in your, if that was say 15 parts per billion in your tank, and then when it comes to cans, it's in your can, it's at like six, 60 or 70 or 80, then you're like, okay, something's going on here that we're not, you know, we're, we're getting some aggressive auction happening here. So I think your benchmark is just going off of that tank reading and that will then dictate, you know, uh, what actions need to be, need to be had there. Um, but that definitely like above, above hundred, you know, plus say 50, 60, 70, um, mm -hmm. there's definitely some concern there that, you know, adjustments can be made to make that, uh, you know, more consistent and higher quality. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think, 
um, trying to benchmark every aspect of your process to help identify if there's an issue and, and where it is, right? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, contamination, just like general cleanliness, obviously is super important too, just like any anytime you're moving, um, anytime you're um, transferring product uh, from one vessel or container to another, there's considerations of sterility and uh, oxygen ingress. And so working kind of hand in hand, looking at both of those is, is key control points in, in packaging, I think is really important. Fortunately, I've seen um, less products spoiled due to contamination once packaged, uh, especially in the last five plus years. I think when I was first starting getting into craft beer, I had no idea what a lot of these styles were supposed to taste like. And I, in retrospect, had a lot of contaminated beer. Um, but I think a lot of the equipment for packaging, um, such as the products that you guys are putting out, have really helped with that. And a lot of the information is more readily available. Um, but maybe you could touch um, like just very uh, surface level and briefly on, you know, what a proper um, cleaning uh, process looks like and what are some considerations um, for, for breweries that might be working with um, a lot of these new types of packaging that they're not familiar with. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's very comparable, like I said, to you know the cleaning process that you're going to put in place for, say, your fermenter or your bright tank. You know, you want to make sure that you have the opportunity, you know, with your your canning system or packaging system to you know utilize proper caustic solution. You know, to, to remove those you know those uh, those soils. You know, especially with uh, you know you know hazy IPAs and some of these more you know high particulate, high protein beers and hot profile beers coming out. Um, you know, you want to make sure you can get rid of all those soils between runs. So there's no you know, drag over from, say, that hoppy beer to a light lager the next day. Um, so that proper C or caustic solution, you know, proper CIP. Um, but then also, you know, just with, like with a tank, you know, a proper sani at the end. Um, and being diligent with, you know, your time and pressure, you know, or sorry, time and, um, you know, concentration of that, of that, uh, that solution. Just to make sure that it's consistent. Uh, and you're, you know, you're, and then you're know, doing those verification. If you have the ability to do say an ATP swab, just to verify, you know, that there's no, you know, living organisms uh, in play there. Uh, I think that's, that's the biggest factor is just, you know, being super hyper diligent on the cleanliness, um, obviously internally, but then also externally on the system as well. Uh, you know, it, it might just, you might be an over, overthought for say the optic of the system, but you know, anything on the outside, uh, any, you know, any beer sitting, you know, spoiling over time, that's going to be a breeding ground for, you know, those, those microbes over time. So I'll make sure that the internals of the system are being that are properly cleaned, but then also the exterior of that system is also cleaned, you know, thoroughly just to ensure, you know, the longevity of your system and ownership of that system is, you know, cost effective for you. Yeah, to totally makes sense. Uh, would you be looking at the same, uh, cleanliness standards as a, a fermenter or a, a conditioning tank. So if you have your standards of, uh, you know, using an ATP swab and looking at 10 or below, would you be looking at those same levels um, in your packaging equipment as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, obviously the lower the better. Um, I'd say use that same sort of range. Um, obviously as close to zero as you yeah. absolutely can uh, would definitely be the best. Cool. Yeah, we, uh, you know, one thing that we didn't touch on in the, the slide before that we should, you know, kind of break down too is like what, you know, the detriments of um, some of these aspects of packaging and considerations going wrong. So, you know, looking at oxygen, I, uh, I judged like three flights of um, hazy IPA at GABF two years ago, and it was pretty instant, you know, you're, you're getting 11 beers in front of you at a time, which is a lot. And instantly being able to look at the color of them, I was able to eliminate two or three of them and, you know, maybe just smell it to make sure that you're not wrong. But uh, in the, in the case of hazy beers or most beers, I guess, you're going to see a, a substantial change in color, uh, which with hazy beers shows up a lot more, uh, you know, quickly because there's just the way it's reflecting light, it's easier to tell that it's not this bright yellow, whereas a light colored IPA getting a, an SRM darker, maybe the beer is intended to, to look like that. But in the case of hazy beers, they get this kind of grayish color, right? Yeah. Um, 
And that that's not even to mention the flavor impact too. Um, staling of malt compounds is uh, super obvious. I had a, a Pilsner pretty recently where the the canned on date was, um, I would say within a month or six weeks top, which isn't terrible, and it was incredibly oxidized already at that point. Uh, buying it directly from the brewery, so that was kind of a bummer and in you know, easy to see what went wrong there and um, something that could have been prevented, which is unfortunate. You know, where, you you know, where it's most obvious, I think, is um, hoppy beers. The, those uh, compounds tend to break down uh, fairly quickly uh, yeah. already on their own, even if you have low uh, TPO levels going into the can. And when we're talking about contamination, you know, differences in um, ABV can be pretty minimal but if you have um, some wild yeast and it sits for a long time you know you're going to see carbonation increase a lot quicker mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be more obvious to the consumer than 0.1.2 percent increase increase in abv cool. and then flavor too and that's generally always for the negative <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um and then a we had a couple questions come in. Um, when canning beers with different yeast strains, is it best to do a rinse caustic rinse or rinse acid rinse between beers? So I guess what what should cleaning, um, what should your cleaning process be? And you know, that's something good to know uh, is that, you know, most craft brewers are working with highly unfiltered beer and the bio load can still be um, pretty significant sometimes going into package. So what's, what are your considerations when looking at that? I mean, from my perspective, if you're sanitizing, cleaning and sanitizing something, it should be um, adequate across the board, but do you have any specific input on that? Yeah, I would, especially if you're doing uh, like that question, you know, multiple or different, you know, yeast strains um, and you may say, and also like say a, a a big IPA versus a, you know, a light lager in that sense too. I would highly recommend, you know, doing that full caustic, you know, rinse sani. Um, but say you're doing, you know, a, a, like a, a light Belgian ale and then, I'll, or even like a, you know, two lighter say style beers. Um, and if it's quite back to back or even say two different type of lagers, um, you know, you could probably get away with say doing a, you know, just doing a rinse and then a sani and then jumping back into it. But I think it just depends on, you know, like you said, the, the load, the hop load, and so the protein load uh, makeup of those, that individual specific style of beer, which I think will dictate, you know, how sort of strenuous and, you know, um, diligent you need to be on that cleanliness. But uh, I'd say for, for a safeguard, I would highly recommend, you know, just doing that consistent caustic, um, you know, rinse sani. But uh, obviously then costs come into play there with using more chemical. So I think just, you know, do dictate whether, you know, just, playing with your schedule also can help and, you know, make that more efficient too, where, you know, if you have a week of just IPAs, you know, you know, your cleaning procedure needs to be, you know, uh, quite more diligent, but if you're doing a lot of uh, say late lagers one week or some, you know, some ambers and some uh, lighter profile beers, that's where you can sort of dictate then how we can schedule this to make it the most efficient. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, another question came in that I, I don't specifically have an answer for, but about pasteurization of after packaging to improve shelf stability, how it's likely to negatively impact uh, flavor, and if that would negate uh, the benefits of shelf stability. I think anytime you're asking about flavor, it's very subjective, so that's gonna have to be determined in-house, but um, do you have any uh, any input on uh, pasteurizing once you've canned? Yeah, I think the big thing with pasteurization, uh, especially for beer, at least it's gonna impact your flavor quite a bit, you know, uh, just to the fact you're raising the increase the temperature of that product. So especially as it, when it comes to oxidation, you know, oxidation, that chemical process is going to, you know, the, the, the reaction, how that, you know, chemical reaction is happening will be expedited as it, the increase of temperature happens. So if with oxidation, you want to keep that product, you know, similar to you, know, any product, you want to keep that in the fridge, put that in the fridge right away. And that just sort of stunts the oxidation, you know, chemical process. But say if you were to pasteurize, you know, you're ramping that temperature up and that's just going to you know, create that reaction at a rapid pace, which then will basically minimize your, the shelf life of your product. Um, so that's sort of the, uh, where pasteurization comes into play. I know there's a lot of, um, a lot, lot of thoughts, thoughts on that out there as, you know, some of the, the bigger, you know, uh, domestic breweries out there are, you know, using that pasteurization for you know, almost like infinite shelf life on their, on their products. But 
Uh, when it comes down to it, those are likely, you know, uh, you know, some lower flavor profile beers that, you know, they're not immediately as affected. Uh, whereas if you're going to do that with an IPA, I would expect your, your flavor profile just to be, you know, it'll drop right off uh, quite quickly and your, your shelf life will be, you know, cut in half um, minimum, mm -hmm. I'd say. From a flavor perspective, right? Totally. Yeah. But from maybe like a, a microbiological standpoint, your shelf stabilities could be increased because you're not risking any possible contamination or that yeast. You know, I the the perspective that I like looking at is, is kind of the opposite of actually um, including a little bit of yeast and, and conditioning in the package um, to help scavenge some of that oxygen and increase shelf life when done right. Totally. Yes. Yeah, so, so that give to get aspect when it comes to it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, any, anytime talking about flavor, it's um, generally very subjective on what your internal standard standards are and, and how you view your product and how you want your customers to receive your product. Um, continuing on uh, contamination, you know, fortunately finished beer is a very stable environment. Uh, low oxygen, again, we're talking about PPB, right? If in, in your job uh, is to, uh, aid them by, you know, providing equipment that can get that as low as possible. Um, low nutrients because it's already gone through fermentation, right? So a lot of those available nutrients have uh, already been converted. It makes it a, a difficult environment for many organisms. But what you, what you do need to look at is there, there still are common beer spoilers. And those tends to be organisms that um, can adapt and thrive in a relatively low pH, low oxygen and, um, low nutrient environment. So you can see cross-contamination, whether it's um, another strain as, as the, the last, one of the last questions asked, and another strain that you work with in-house. Um, there's a good chance that if you do have cross-contamination, um, it's something that you should be looking at with uh, an adequate micro program um, in, your, in your lab. But there's a good chance that it won't affect or impact flavor too much because again, the most of those um, sugars that are easily converted by yeast, uh, you know, are no longer available and same with, with nutrients and all that. And you have a very small population generally. Um, but then there's also, you know, not looking at um, specific contamination per se, but SD1 positive strains that maybe didn't fully attenuate the beer out. So beer that's not finished, um, that continues to attenuate in the package, that's a consideration. Um, along with your lactic acid uh, bacteria, which again is going to going to impact flavor fairly quickly, depending on um, how what, what volume and, and quantity those organisms you have. Uh, but that's something that's going to be very impactful and noticeable to the end consumer. Sure. Um, we had another question when using the same yeast strain but different beers, would going from low to high ABV be sufficient? I'm not sure what that question means, to be honest. Um, so if you want to clarify, we can try to answer that better for you. Um, and this was something that I thought was really cool, right? Looking at the, the financials, because uh, maybe there's um, some of those decision makers on this call, but I know most um, production workers or uh, most employees in the industry that are looking at canning and packaging and beer quality uh, are looking at quality as number one, but, you know, financial drivers are, are super important and understanding them are super important. If you can make an increase to quality, uh, how do you, how do you communicate that and quantify it? Right. Uh, so maybe you can touch on what the, the, the graph you have here and talking about product waste and how different pieces of equipment might be able to uh, minimize that. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think, I think high quality, you know, it's dissolved oxygen and low waste is the other main driver there. Like you said, um, cause you know, the last thing we want is to be, you know, dumping beer. I mean, you, you spend, you know, like I said, you spend months, weeks and months, you know, putting that time and effort into producing that. And the last thing we want is to see, you know, half that product or, you know, even just a small fraction of that go down the drain uh, when that could be going into a can for your customer. And uh, then, you know, essentially you make your money off of that. Uh, we want to make sure you're getting every dollar out of that tank uh, that's possible. And that's where low waste comes into play here. So I mean, you can see how fast, you know, that, that cost uh, expedites here. If you look at that graph, I mean, even on the small scale, you know, 500 barrels, you know, 10% loss, 
you know, you're at twenty six thousand um, dollars. You know, an entry level system is is right there. Uh, so you're just dumping that right down the drain. And then as you increase production, you know that that number just gets even larger. Where you no know, ten percent loss at uh, twenty five hundred barrels is you know that's a quite a it's a fully kitted, uh, nice little automated system there. Um, so you know, when it comes to waste. There's you know, like you see on the slide here. There's visible waste. So that's you know waste coming out of the can and uh, you know jumping or you know dropping on the on the conveyor belt, you know, dripping off the line. Um, that's obviously, you know, big no-no and very apparent. Uh, and then you know, the other one is invisible waste, which is, you know, you can, in a sense, you know, you can, some, you know, facilities will over overfill cans to, you know, limit that headspace, you know, to then, you know, have that low dissolved oxygen. But in fact, you know, overfilling that can, you're, you're wasting beer over time. So, you know, if you think of a, a 12 ounce can, uh, you know, that uh, the overflow of that can is actually 12.6 ounces. So if you take that 0.6 of an ounce, you know, and then multiply that across, say, one case, and then over over the course of, say, one whole packaging run, uh, you know, that's going to be, you know, you could probably, that would be a couple cases in there uh, that that's just, you know, uh, being given to the you know, those customers for free in a sense where you, know, you could be making, say, 12 extra cases on a given packaging run if you have that proper, you know, 12 ounce, 12 ounce sorry, packaging fill every single time. Um, and, you know, there's, when it comes to, you know, packaging with, within that waste, you know, in the overfill, there's, um, you know, parameters put in place, there's time-based filling, you know, there's volume-based filling, uh, and then there's, you know, using some you know, fill probes for connectivity to stop all flow to make sure that's consistent. Uh, I think it's just keeping that, you know, top of mind is that, you know, you want to, you know, throw a packaging run, you know, you, you have that uh, set volume in your bright tank, you know, have that on, on, uh, on your records. And then at the end of that run, you know, have that number of how many cans were actually filled uh, and then what that volume is and how that equates to what that original volume was. And then I think that that overarching goal for any facility would be to, you know, minimize that as much as possible in the sense, you know, we want to be more efficient. Um, and that's just, that's the liquid. And then it also comes into play of the raw materials in the sense that, you know, over a packaging run, you know, there are some uh, features coming into play that can, you know, you'll have say, you know, leaky seams, or, you know, you're gonna have a couple lids, you know, dropping on the ground, or, you know, uh, you know just poor can, you know, filling. And that's gonna also add on to the, the waste uh, as, as, a, as a general whole there. So, you know, the, the raw materials, but then also the main thing and the main driver would just be that liquid. Uh, Cause we want to make sure that, you know, especially right now during the time of the world that, you know, breweries are making, you know, as much money and are being as efficient as possible. And I think it's waste and product waste can be overlooked so easy um, just because people are trying to get in cans fast and quickly and get it at the door. When in fact, if you slow down, you know, look at the process, uh, make sure that everything's fine tuned and you're going to be, you know, making money and saving money uh, in the long term, that will be you know, a show um, for every brewery and every business. Yeah, we, uh, I was incredibly surprised that, you know, the deeper you get into looking at your cogs of specific brands, uh, especially hoppy brands, there's already so much loss when it comes to brewing those beers. Uh, and then seeing more loss just because we're working with a new packaging format of going to cans the margins become really tight really quick and you know it's it's difficult to to be profitable on a small scale without really managing those cogs and i think this is a great example you know obviously this isn't talking about you know the the yeast and fermentation side of it but i think it really needs to be considered and you know same thing like when we're when we're teaching uh yeast classes and people are talking about harvesting or or you know the, the biggest one for us is um you know somebody wanting to propagate and they might be a you know a thousand barrel a year brewery and it's like to to do that right it's very expensive and time consuming but there are processes and there are pieces of equipment maybe you get the right yeast brink where you can harvest and and repitch your yeast it's you know looking at the same thing i think the finances do need to drive a lot of those decisions when you're working with pieces of equipment or, or raw materials uh, because it's you know it is a business at the end of the day yeah absolutely So, you know, kind of the same realm, but uh, is there a price to quality? I think that that transitioned into that, uh, you know, very smoothly, but yes, there definitely is, but, but there's um, consequences to all that too. And you got to weigh the pros and cons. And I think, 
you know, doing things right up front. And as I mentioned earlier, defining those goals and defining those parameters and understanding the true cost of something. And I think you touched on that pretty well because you might look at it as a one-off of, you know, this, this canning line costs a lot more. This is $40,000 more than the other, but if you can uh, monitor those fill levels and that efficiency, you know, there's ways to justify that that pays for itself very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. And then to, you know, just add on to, you know, this slide here as well, you know, that was, you know, we touched on waste there. Great. But then another area of waste as well as, you know, the waste of that product uh, when it's affected by oxygen. So it sort of ties everything together where, you know, if you're running say in-house analysis on your product, uh, say you have a you know, retention case from every, every batch and you're, you're, you're monitoring that say after the three months and you're like, Oh no, like this is reaching the end of its life. This is not up to our standards. And then, um, you know, then you have to pull a recall, say from the, you know, the either distributor or, you know, the, um, you know, that retail shop, that the liquor store, and that's where that, that cost and that waste um, is, also gets quite pricey where, you know, you have, you, know, you package that whole, that whole tank, you know, it's, it's gone out to those, those store shelves, but some of them are sticking, you know, longer than you expected. Uh, and say, if you have that, that poor quality, you know, filling where your, your volumes of dissolved oxygen TPO are higher, that it might in fact be, you know, it might only be on the shelf for a month before you're getting those recalls. And then you're really throwing money down the drinks. So you have to not only, you know, you're not only losing that liquid, but now you're losing all of that raw material, all of that, you know, cost of distribution. You know, there's so many more variables are coming into play now that it's at that retail location where, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot more expensive to, you know, throw all those cans out, you know, uh, eliminate those as opposed to just dumping a, dumping a tank in the brewery in that sense where, you know, you've already, you've already packaged it. It's gone out, you know, you use the, you know, series and pack techs, you got cans, you got lids, uh, you got corrugate, you know, um, containers there and you know, the casings. And it just, like you said, your cogs are just going to be, um, you know, through the roof and just eliminated really quickly there. Uh, you want to briefly touch on seam quality, you know, when we were setting this up, it was, you know, something that I had been seeing a lot go around on the internet. I think somebody was um, analyzing, you know, the seams um, of a lot of other breweries to, to look at the quality, uh, maybe some different ways of, of measuring that and what um, could be detrimental if you have a poorly um, seamed can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so basically the, the seaming process, this is the last area that, you know, uh, a production facility or a brewery, you know, has control of before it leaves your door. That's the, that's the last sort of step where that beer's gone in can, lid's gone on, it's sealed, and then that can is now complete and will go to your customer. Uh, and if that seam is out of spec, uh, you know, you're going to have, you know, a lot of downstream effects where it's going to be, you know, loss of carbonation, you know, the quality, you're going to have, you know, more oxygen will come in. Uh, you know, just ultimately a poor, you know, customer experience, which will then, you know, lead us into more recalls uh, and leaky seams. You know, leaky seams are the most, you know, visually apparent issue. Uh, and you know, it'd be best to see that on the line during the, the packaging uh, process. So, you know, you make those tweaks uh, in real time and then it saves you the, the headaches down the road. Uh, but, you know, the thing with, with seams too is that they can be uh, sort of sneaky in the sense that, you know, they might look good optically from the outside, uh, just, you know, two cans side by side might look, you know, identical. Uh, but that's where, you know, the measuring um, specifications come into play where you know, I'd highly recommend in our team here, you know, we super diligent on, on training all of our customers on, you know, the proper you know, procedure to measure that. So using a micrometer, you know, using a counter sink gauge. Uh, and then, you know, as you get more advanced, you know, you bring in the digital seam inspection piece of equipment, but that gives you, you know, real time analysis just to confirm and verify that, you know, that first control point has been set uh, and you're within spec um, for, and you know, all of your can manufacturers will give you and will, you know, will um, with your cans, you'll receive those specs. So to give you that gauge of what to expect. Um, but I would, you know, highly recommend beginning of your packaging run, you know, doing those measurements, making sure it's within spec. And then, you know, consistently throughout that run, you know, you're pulling the odd can off, doing those micrometer analysis, just to make sure that nothing has, you know, tweaked over the course of a run. Um, Cause you know, things can happen quick, you know, as we know in any process of the brewery, you know, uh, things go wrong and they, when it goes wrong, it typically happens quite quickly. So, you know, it's a matter of, you know, seeing that right away, making the adjustment so that you're not, you know, packaging 
12 or you know, 1200 cases um, that you missed and they all have leaky seams now. And now they've gone to your distributor. They're, they're out there and then you're just you're wreaking havoc there and uh, backtracking. It's, just a, it's a huge headache. You know, I've been there and I, I just don't want anyone to experience that. That's for sure. On the positive, you'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way I kind of I look at uh, negative experiences when stuff like that happens. It's like, I will never do that again. <laughs> and caution everybody else to do the to do the same or not do the same um we've got a couple more minutes so we'll kind of breeze through this next part but you know um looking at shelf life so once the beer is canned or packaged what you should be looking at as i kept saying create a target and measuring to that target so have intention behind what you're looking for um just running something through the lab or through the pan through a sensory panel without any idea of what you're looking for is um, not super useful, but uh, creating a target profile and measuring against that and seeing if there's any deviation or change. Um, you know, if it, if it comes from looking uh, at, at lab specs, you know, uh, plating or PCR, seeing if there's any contaminants or microbial growth, um, looking at alcohol or carbo carb carbohydrate analysis and seeing if there's actually any, any change to the um, stability of that product um, and then verifying if there's any actual um, flavor impact from that by by utilizing a sensory panel and uh, it's it's crazy how often overlooked the human palate is as, a, as an um, instrument to, to measure um, some of the the specs of a beer because we know when something's wrong pretty quick and oftentimes you might even look at um, the lab analysis and, and not really be able to see anything wrong with it but you taste it and you know something's wrong um, and that's kind of the case of looking at that uh, you know high levels of, of do is you might not be able to measure that in a lab depending on when you're measuring it if it's too late but you could probably taste it so you know you need to work backwards and find out where that ingress was and where that that issue was um, considerations i think we touched on you know in, in a lot of detail but oxygen style it's going to change um, shelf life quite a bit and um, how much it might be able to mask high levels of oxygen to um, financial and internal considerations. So in summary, like I said, we got about five minutes to answer a few more questions. If anybody wants to start throwing them in the Q&A box, we have a couple already that we can get to. Um, but packaging is a lucrative way of expanding sales as we've seen um, in the last year. And I think it's going to, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of people drinking at home for the foreseeable future, even as things open up. Um, I think people sitting at bars and, and tasting rooms, especially, um, you know, Cal California and San Diego is looking pretty good right now with reopening, but, um, you know, different parts of the world are still having a lot of issues and might see an ebb and flow of openings and closing. Um, and it should be, a, packaging should be as impactless as to your product as possible. And again, I think that's uh, a, a great way of looking at it is, you know, just ensuring that product quality is your beer is not going to get any better at that point. It only has the potential of getting worse. So it's really important um, to manipulate those um, those the aspects of packaging that, that can keep quality up. And then consider efficiencies uh, and long term quality impact when selecting equipment and um, implementing new processes. So I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Before we get to the last couple of questions, did you want to give a shout out where people, um, if they're interested in um, some of your canning lines and um, speaking to you a little bit further, how they can reach you or where they should be looking? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we have, uh, <clears throat> we have sales reps and we work with companies all over the world. So um, yes, feel free to you know, use this link here, reach out either by phone or you know to sales at cast.com. Uh, and then we'll, you know, direct you to the the proper sales rep here at Cask, and we'll we'll love to help and you know make this as uh, as easy of a process as possible to to get into canning and uh, especially as companies are growing, you know, especially through the pandemic here. Um, there's been a lot of entry into canning, but then a lot of you know businesses are growing exponentially, which is great to see. So you know we're loving it. We love to help you know all aspects. Uh, and like I said, we always make it as easy as possible because I've been there. You know, canning it can seem like a daunting task. You know, to get into and to, to jump into and bring into your repertoire. But, um, you know, we have a great team here and we just want to make this whole process, you know, super easy. Uh, and we just want to help you guys, you know, grow. At the end of the day, we just want to help businesses grow and succeed, um, you know, especially right now. It's wild times and uh, we'll all get through this together and where we are. And uh, it's going to be great to see the future of cans uh, just, you know, skyrocket here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been awesome. 
Um, now we've got time for two questions. Um, so to kind of summarize what Daniel asked, um, looking at different types of canning lines and different manufacturers, um, is there a lot of variability between um, quality of the amount of uh, oxygen that's that's ingressed into beer in different packages, or is, does it more have to do with the um, ability to to fine tune that process? Uh, yeah, I would uh, I would say there would be a large difference between canning lines. Um, you know, there's each one has sort of a, their own unique you know processes. Uh, and in these processes, you know, we've been just spe specifically cask, you know, we've been doing this for, for 20 years, you know, fine tuning the whole process. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of small factors, you know, the, the materials that are used in the line, you know, that, that filling technology is the big one uh, that's really going to affect, you know, how much auction is going to be entered into that can uh, on a consistent basis. Um, so there's definitely, to answer the question from a high level, absolutely, there's a, gonna be a lot of differences. Um, you know, that's something that we can, Daniel, Daniel yeah, we can uh, definitely jump into uh, down the road if that's something you're interested in. Cool. And then uh, from Alex, they've been seeing lacto and bacillus in their beers from packaging. Where should they be focusing attention for this source? They believe it's happening somewhere in packaging. To, to me, my perspective on that would be if you're seeing that, I would try um, pulling samples from different parts of your process to see if it actually is appearing in packaging or maybe it's um, somewhere in a tank and it's just at small enough quantities that maybe it's a little bit more difficult for you to measure. Uh, bacillus isn't as much of a concern, but lacto obviously uh, can be from a, a flavor standpoint and alter the beer pretty drastically. So um, assuming it is from the canning and, and not from another uh, point in the process, where should, where should they look at from your perspective, Simon? Yeah, I would definitely look, uh, you know, within the fill heads, uh, as well as, you know, that, that supply tubing going into the canning system. Uh, you know, there's can be a lot of nooks and crannies with, you know, any system. Um, and it'd be likely you know, similar to a draft line, right? You want to make sure that those, that tubing going into the system is as clean as possible. Uh, and then especially, you know, within the fill head. So I, I would first, like I said, you know, find those critical control points and just sort of work, you know, backwards to forwards where, you know, start, say, at the tank, move forward, make those tests analysis. And then that should really help, you know, give you some clarity on, all right, it's in the fill head, you know, I've made it to the last step, uh, no lacto until here, you look in those fill heads uh, and then, you know, there's quite a good chance you might make some replacement parts there uh, on no matter the line, just to make sure that you're fully eliminating that because those bacteria are hard to, you know, eliminate, um, you know, consistently. So I just, you know, probably recommend even just getting, you know, some new, new parts and just starting fresh. Uh, just so that that headache, you know, doesn't uh, continue on. Is there an easy way to determine a specific fill head that's having an issue, whether it's contamination or um, a DO issue? I think that would all that would depend, um, you know, within you know the the manufacturer in in the system. Um, I think that would be one of the, the harder aspects too, right? Like if I, you know you know, you're you're packing twenty, you know, say a full tank. Uh, and you don't really know during that canning run, you know, where that, which, which can was infected throughout. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where it can get really tricky and where you sort of have to look at a high level and be like, okay, let's just, you know, let's overreact here. Let's just clean, over clean, you know, and overanalyze. Uh, and then just, you know, just negate that issue um, from the, from the beginning. Uh, it might, might be costly, uh, mm -hmm. but I think, I think the cost of making those adjustments on the line are going to be a lot less than the cost of your product going down the drain and those that poor um, you know, representation to your customers at the end of the day. Totally. Yeah. It's, there's nothing more frustrating than having one out of every three or five cans have an issue and not being able to turn, determine where it came from and that inconsistency, right. Where yeah. everybody else is saying this beer is great. And then you're just like, man, the last two I had were not up to the standard. Uh, last question. And then, um, We'll wrap it up, but is cask looking into making machines safe for hot water sterilization, or is it still safe enough using uh, paracetic acid? Uh, hi, yeah, we are. Uh, there are some internal discussions and uh, research going on, so I can't say too much uh, into that. But definitely, uh, that, is, that is a high topic and a topic of mine that we're we're looking to, uh, you know, you know, improve on here for sure. Awesome. Maybe that'll be the next webcast. There it is. There it is. <laughs>
Cool. Uh, I appreciate you taking time today um, and having these conversations. I think it's a lot of fun. And I think it's fun to, you know, look at some aspects of the microorganisms that, that White Labs is working with and how it may play a role as well as a lot of other considerations into every part of a working brewery. Um, I think this has been a really fun forum to, to kind of branch out a little bit and get, you know, a lot of our friends and colleagues to to share conversations that we probably would have had over a beer uh, instead get to, you know, share it with everybody else who also has similar questions. So I appreciate taking time. Um, you know, the follow-up email will go out. Um, I think it goes out uh, 24 hours after this airs um, and I'll have your guys' information on there as well, but. Um, Always a know. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. We'll definitely keep in touch and talk soon. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Yeah, looking forward to that next beer. Whenever I can come down to San Diego, it's my first flight down, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll see you at the bar. We'll see you at the bar. <laughs> Cheers. See you, man. Yeah.